So as, as a bit of an introduction, last Sunday we were looking at Jesus walking on the water to his disciples, and they were in the windstorm on the sea. And there's a parallel with Jesus looking at them from the mountain, right? The Father looking down from his mountain upon us, and, and we're in the sea of trouble and the sea of this world and so forth. And then Jesus comes walking to them and then turns and he's alongside the boat. He comes parallel to their boat. And the Holy Spirit is the paracletus, right? He's alongside. He comes alongside mankind. Then Jesus enters into the boat with the disciples. Of course, Jesus, God became a man and dwelt among us and entered into our troubles with us. He looks down on compassion, comes alongside us in his spirit, and he enters into our struggle in the incarnation. And when he came into the boat, the wind died down. In John's gospel, uh, the account of that windstorm, it says in John 6, 21, then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. And isn't that awesome? When he comes to get us, we are immediately going to be with him in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be in that heavenly land with him. And I just think that's just so awesome. And also, that's our our destination. Our our end point really is not someplace on this earth. Once I get there, then I'll have. If I, then I'll be happy, etc. No, it's when we, when the Lord is with us, hey, we have more than we could need. We're content. We've got all we need. Jesus is with us. We're at our destination, so to speak. Now, um, In verse 53 to 56 here of Mark chapter 6, it skips some events that the other Gospels record, uh, but it, like, I'm the bread of life, that section in John 6, that happens somewhere before this, but um, it provides this really vivid summary of the healing ministry of Jesus. It doesn't talk about his teaching, though he's known as a teacher, he's a rabbi. It talks about his healing in this passage, really vividly, okay, and Um, we're going to draw a contrast of the great number of people seeking Jesus and the Pharisees in chapter 7, verse 1, and then what happens with this confrontation that Pharisees and scribes bring to Jesus. They weren't seeking him to know him, but to counter the popularity of Jesus, and they wanted to denounce him. You know, why do we come to Jesus? Well, and and why do we want to bring others to him? And... Who do we believe that he is? You know, this, this is wonderful. Like, they came, the Pharisees came to Jesus for the wrong reasons, really. They don't believe who he is, and they're not helping anybody, right? And the, the people in this text that we're about to read, um, they came to Jesus in faith, and they wanted to bring others to Jesus, and, and they believed that he could heal and who he is. So let's have Matt come on up here, please. And uh, he's going to read Mark 6, verse 53 to 56, and chapter 7, verse 1 for us. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of uh, Genesaret and anchored there. And when they had come out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through the whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Lord Jesus, we want to know you more intimately. We want to know you as our Redeemer, our Savior, our friend. We also want to know you as our healer. Lord, open our eyes to see spiritual things, our our understanding. We pray that you would give us wisdom and spiritual understanding, like Colossians 1 says, Lord. Father, that you would uh, open our hearts more and more to the glory of Jesus Christ, that he would be made known to us through your Spirit, And God, that we would just delight in our Savior who heals us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in verse 53 of Mark 6, uh, we see that they had crossed over and they came to the land of Gennesaret. They traveled from east to west in the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee or Lake of Galilee. And Gennesaret was a plain about three miles 
uh, long and one mile wide, and, uh, or one mile long and three miles wide. It was a densely populated spot. Now Luke 5.1 says the, the lake of Gennesaret, that's also in uh, Maccabees, which is a, a book in the Apocrypha, but it, the, the Sea of Galilee may have been named after this town, Gennesaret, the lake Gennesaret. And it, it, uh, it likely did give it its name. Josephus describes the fertility, climate, and beauty of this town in such glowing terms, just this beautiful, wonderful location here. And uh, they anchored or tied off there. They, they tied to an anchor. Or they anchored the boat uh, on the shore at Gennesaret. And verse 54 says, When they came out of the boat, immediately the people knew him. Immediately the people recognized him. So he was well known uh, in, in this area of Galilee. And it must have been early in the morning, shortly after daybreak. And they, the people that live there, they're at the shore doing something or they're, they're cleaning something and they see Jesus. And so what starts to happen? What do they do? Well, it says they ran through the whole surrounding region, which, which is broader than the town of Gennesaret itself. They're running through the whole surrounding region. And Jesus being there got everyone excited. They're running to the neighborhood towns, villages, and all around calling out, to their friends. It says the verb ran about. They ran about. That's only actually here in the New Testament. And it pictures a real hurried circulation of the news. It pictures a, a scurrying, a running about, you know. Uh, like if you turn the light on or in a, in a dark place and then you go, oh, whoa, there's some, some mice or something. They scatter. They run about. That's the idea that it brings to us. And the people were doing this. They dropped what they were doing, the regular business of their day, they were, whether they were sewing cloth or preparing flour or, or whether they were mending or cooking or whether they were trading or selling or whatever it was they were doing, people stopped what they were doing. Their regular business of their agricultural society stopped because Jesus was there. And they would run to family members, to cousins, to aunts who needed help or to friends that they knew who, who needed help. And what did they do? They picked them up. So it has the term throughout this text, they're sick. They're sick. They're, they're sick friends. They're sick family members. Whoever they knew that was sick, they went to them. They ran to them, and, and they picked up their sick, the ones they knew and loved who were sick, and they carried them. It's beautiful pictures. They likely put them on what, what was called pallets, but it's really it's, it's a cot, really. It would be a, a piece of canvas with, with dowels, and they would carry them on these, on these cots, and... And that would mean that they would need more than two people often. You need at least two people to carry their sick. And they were carrying them on foot for distances, right? Those who were wealthy would obviously use a mule or something like that to carry their family members. And I want you to picture that, that everybody's running around because Jesus is there to go get their sick and bring them to Jesus. That's the destination, of course. But look closely at the end of verse 55. They ran throughout the surrounding region, began to carry about on beds, those who were sick, to wherever they heard he was. Wherever they heard he was. And you can imagine one person getting their brother or sister and carrying them on a cot, uh, uh, carrying on a cot one of their sick relatives, and they have all this energy about their task, and then they ask what's happening. You know, another person sees them, what's happening? And then, oh, Jesus is over here. And then they go and they get a family member and they go get a sick relative and they start bringing them their cot. And people are literally, the picture is they're going in, in cross directions. They're running all over where they heard he was. Oh, he was over here. No, oh, no, he's not over here anymore. He's, he's over in this location because the text also shows that Jesus is moving from location to location as well. He's, he's moving around healing people. He's not evading anyone. He's going to everyone. And so they're bringing people to wherever they heard he was. And so you can picture that, people going from place to place in various directions. And when they didn't find him in one place, people would say, oh, he was just here, he left, he's over there now, and so on, right? Where they were likely to find him. And they're asking each other, People are asking people where Jesus is. Why? So they could help those who were sick get to Jesus. Okay, great parallel in that, isn't there? Um, <clears throat> and they wanted to know, so the, and, and everyone was telling others. Verse 56 now is a really full, full verse. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid their sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment 
And as many as touched him were made well. Now we're going to spend the bulk of our time looking at this, this verse here. Wherever he entered, wherever Jesus entered, whether it was, uh, he, well, wherever he entered, first of all, he found a crowd that was waiting for him. There was always a crowd waiting for him, and there was always a crowd trying to get to him wherever he was as well. But he entered he, villages, cities, or the country, the text says. So it takes the scope, and, and it doesn't say, oh, he only went to the popular place. Not at all. He went to where? It says it in the text. He went to the villages. He went to the cities. He went to the country. The scope seems to be large and wide, obviously more than Gennesaret itself. And he was moving from one place to another, doing good. The country meaning the fields where people were working in the fields. You know, they were under employment. Maybe they couldn't stop what they were doing or else they'd lose their job. Well, he went to them too. You know, whether it was a well-known place or an unknown place, Jesus would enter any place, large or small. He's not a respecter of persons or locations. Jesus wants to go there. Jesus is more than willing to go there. Now, we have our preferences where we would like to go. You never see in a destination magazine, you know, come up to the great north of of, of Russia or something like that, you know, and you like, you just, these are places people don't go. I I I haven't seen much on, you know, Tasmania or somewhere like that or Antarctica or some some place that's just, uh, you know, very, very, um, off the beaten track, you don't see that much. But it's, it's the popular places, the destinations that you see, you know, that are being advertised and so forth. And Jesus will go anywhere. I just love that idea. It's, it's true. He will go anywhere. Any corner, any jungle, any place that's, that's dismal, that's bleak, that's populated, anywhere. And when someone says, I have a heart for this location, we can't judge them, you know, because Jesus has a heart for that location, believe it or not. He's on mission, right? So whether it's a city or whether it's the country, he has a heart for that location. And what people would do is in these places is they would lay their sick in the marketplaces, it says. And there's no marketplace, obviously, in the country. So what does this mean? It, it really just means the common meeting area. It's simply the place where people would gather. That's where people would lay their sick. It, it, the idea is when they heard about Jesus, they ran and got their sick friends and relatives, and they'd find wherever Jesus was and they'd bring them to that place and wherever he was most likely to pass they would lay them there where Jesus was most likely to pass by them okay and then they would beg him at that point they would appeal to Jesus and when it says that they begged him it's it's in the tense that they would say it again and again they would beg him again and again they would repeatedly make a plea to Jesus that he would come their way and touch them and come by and come close to this sick person who couldn't get up on their own and couldn't come near to Jesus. They're begging that he would come near to them. And appealing to his heart, of course he will. He's going to come near to them. It says as many as touched him were made well. He made himself available to as many as possible. To as many as possible. It says that they begged that they might just touch the hem of his garment. Just the hem of his garment. Perhaps the news of the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years. That news circulated, right? She was healed. And what did she do? She touched the hem of his garment. And that was in her heart. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. I'll be made well. And and that news traveled around so much. It became so well known to everyone that Jesus heals people. And, and I like how it's as many as touched him were made well and that he made himself to as many as possible while they still had to reach out in, with a measure of faith towards him. You know, and, and again, Jesus is called a teacher throughout the scriptures. He's teaching throughout the scriptures. There's no mention of him teaching in this context. And, and some scholars question or commentators whether he was teaching in this context because it really seems that he was just going from place to place hurriedly healing people. That's what it seems to be going on here. But he was teaching, obviously, in John 6 and so forth, which, uh, which is, is uh, within the scope of this passage or before it. Once they landed Gennesaret, some other events did happen, we see in the other Gospels. Nevertheless, um, he's, he is doing this ministry of healing all over the region here. And it's without question he's a healer. You know, as many as touched him were made well. How can that be? How can that be? People desperately wanted to be made well. 
and the world is spending billions, if not trillions, on trying to stay well or be made well, how many, how many billions are being spent on that annually? It's, you can't calculate it. I don't think anyone could calculate it. You know, uh, I, was, I was looking at articles this week, and uh, there's, there was too many articles. You could go search on the internet and think about this concept here, and y you would come up with, uh, uh, you know, a dozen more articles that I never saw, and somehow they all relate to this topic. You know, um, if you're specifically looking, usually what my wife and I do, if we look at the news, we're going to look at the science section. And in the science section, you'll see things. You know, there was one we saw this week of a, of a tech millionaire from Silicon Valley, and he spent well over $250,000 in the last couple of years just trying to enhance himself. He has perfect hearing, and yet he has $6,000 hearing aids. You know, just so he can hear that much, just to enhance his hearing. He's taking drugs he doesn't need, but they might just help him. You know, he's taking everything he can, and he's trying to enhance himself, and yet, he probably doesn't even jog. Um, but it was just a crazy story of this guy. He's trying to live forever. He's trying to live as long as he can. And, and, and so the world is in a place where this is so applicable to everyone. Everyone. No one escapes this need. At some point or another, people need help physically. All those with sicknesses were carried to Jesus. And that's true forever. You know, that, that those with sicknesses can still be carried to Jesus, in the sense, through prayer, carried to Jesus, uh, bring people to church, tell people about the gospel of Jesus. We're, we have the gospel on our feet, and we have the authority to publish the good news of the Messiah. And so we have the right to carry the good news to people who are sick. And in a sense, that's carrying people to Jesus, I guess, right? And he still receives those in need. Everyone has sin, and they, they need to come to Jesus. He healed people wherever they were, cities, towns, or countries. And God sent Philip. He was in the middle of a revival in the book of Acts in Samaria. And God removed him from that revival and sent him to one man in the desert, the Ethiopian eunuch. One man that needed a touch from the Lord. He needed to hear the gospel. And that was the Lord's movement. And Philip didn't complain about that. One person, I was in the middle of hundreds coming to Christ, you know, or something. No, that's, the Lord has that. That's the Lord's purposes. Uh, James O. Frazier, Beyond the Ranges. You could watch a documentary on him or read his book, but about going to the Lisu people in China and just his heart for these people and just laying down his one life and not seeing fruit for years to come, but now still to this day known as a Christian people. And... God would send his message out. He, would, he wants to go to people, doesn't he? Regardless of occupation or location, regardless of specific sickness or illness, regardless of, the, of their attitudes, the healing and life is offered freely in Jesus. And of course, forgiveness of sins is the greatest healing of all. And, and I hope we're going to tie these in together a little more. I wasn't uh, necessarily going to go into some of the idea of what is healing our physical bodies about. But the more I studied this, I, I, I didn't want to just make the quick jump and say, he forgives us of sin. What, that's the greatest healing. He's going to give us new bodies. We're healed, which is totally true. But there's more, I think, involved with the healing of our bodies and, and the forgiveness of sins and the glorious new uh, body that he's prepared for us, right? So that the the mansion, I go to prepare a, a palace for you or a mansion for you, right? It's right here on this board. When he goes to prepare that place for us, it's not a place that has a doorbell and a, and, uh, a mansion and a chandelier and two staircases going nowhere. It's, it's a body that's going to be a mansion for us, right? So I want to look more at, at um, what's going on with, with the literal healing that was happening temporarily, yes, but in these people's lives. Uh, beyond just the forgiveness of sins, but reveling in that too. So he cares for, summar, summarizing that, he cares for our eternal state, and yet he also does care for our temporary state. He does. Sometimes I think um, I overlook that. I'm just saying, okay? 
Sometimes people emphasize the temporary healing. What I mean by temporary is we're all going to, it's appointed for men to die once. After this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. We're all going to die one day. So even Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, had to die still, right? So whatever sickness I have or you have, we're still bound in this body to die. It's got to pass on one day, right? Unless, unless Jesus returns and we're raptured and, it, and it's still, it's going to be transformed in a moment. Now, so this body has to change. It's got to, it's got to either die or change or something. It's got to happen to it. Now, um, some people emphasize the temporary healings of this body so much, you know, and there's too much emphasis on it. And I think at times I've emphasized it too little at times. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but ultimately the gospel needs to be preached, right? Now, I'm rambling. They recognized him. They ran to him. They brought others who had need to him wherever they heard he was, and as many as touched him were made well. Are they recognizing Jesus as God? That he's come to heal the world of its sin? Do, they, do people know where they need to go to get to, to Jesus? Right? There's many people, people presenting a false Christ. Do people hear? And do they know where to go? Now, he's a healer. I didn't count, but uh, I read on one of the Bible websites that there are 41 verses referring to Jesus healing and uh, just specific verses that say that literally. And people want healing. Um, again, can't calculate the amount of resources that are spent on this. Now, on one hand, we have amazing bodies that seem to be designed to live forever. We really do. And, and no one wants to be sick or dying. But on the other hand, we are all overcome with a continuous dying that's happening in our bodies. Our bodies, basically, they, they seem to be designed with this amazing ability to heal, right? Um, there's compensating mechanisms in our bodies that when a cut happens, blood cells with every heartbeat pump to that area. They fight infection. They start healing the wound. And, and they provide nourishment so that, that any infectious material or, or to stop the bleeding, all that could happen and this, this wound can heal. That's design. That's amazing. Uh, every cell in our body eventually replaces itself with new cells. That's amazing. But the problem is we are dying faster than we are repairing or replacing, if you will. There's more problems, too. And it can be summarized by the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is really there's a loss of energy when energy is exchanged. And uh, the energy cannot be used again, basically. It becomes useless. It's called entropy. Entropy means like deterioration. And entropy increases. Deterioration is always increasing. It's an ever-growing disorder, not order. That's, that's a law in our universe, that there's a principle of entropy decay, a continuous increase of disorder in all the elements. Continuous decay, a degradation of all life, wearing down of everything that's happening. And we can't, we can try to slow it down, but it can't be overcome. The first law of thermodynamics is, there's four laws, but the, won't go through them all. The first one is basically, it's about the, the, the quantity of energy. That energy is not created or destroyed, right? It just changes forms. The second law is about the quality, not quantity, but quality of energy. The quality of energy, energy dissipates. It's unusable, okay? So I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a chemist. I'm none of these things, I'm not a physicist, but we have access to all sorts of amazing information. And again, anywhere you look, you're going to see interesting stuff. And I think it relates quite often to the Bible because the Bible has the answers. The Bible has the answers. So um, forgive me, but I'm going to go into, I'm going to read some, some quotes from some of the, the articles I was reading this week about our bodies. And, and I was really interested in looking up, are we meant to live forever? Is the human body meant to live forever? How is it designed to do so? And what's wrong with it? Why isn't it living forever? Um, and so I was looking at, obviously, secular science and then the scripture and comparing them, okay? 
So uh, if this totally bores you, go ahead and, and take, a, take a nap if you'd like. But uh, listen to this. Here's this person. And um, some of the names and pronunciations of these things I won't get. But Sable Mitra, a professor of physics at Missouri State University, finds the second law of, uh, to be the most interesting of the four laws of thermodynamics. There are a number of, quote, ways to state the second law, he said. At a very microscopic level, it simply says that if you have a system that is isolated, any natural process in that system progresses in the direction of increasing disorder or entropy of the system. From down to the smallest level, it's an increasing disorder, okay? Mitra explained that all processes result in an increase in entropy. Even when order is increased in a specific location, for example, by the self-assembly of molecules to form a living organism. You think, wow, that's, that's assembling information. That's growth of information, right? That's something good is happening. But when you take the entire system, including the environment, into account, there's always a net increase in entropy. In another example, crystals can form from a salt solution as water is evaporated. Crystals are more orderly than salt molecules in solution. However, vaporized water is much more disorderly than liquid water. The process taken as a whole results in a net increase in disorder. So whatever process occurs, whether it's just, uh, just some chemicals or whether it's organic in our bodies or whatever, at the end of the process, there will be an a greater increase in disorder than order. Isn't that cheerful? Isn't that good news? That is from, that's from LiveScience.com. So here's another one, the, the fate of the universe, same website. The second law also predicts the end of the universe. According to Boston University, quote, it implies that the universe will end in a heat death in which everything is at the same temperature. This is the ultimate level of disorder. If everything is at the same temperature, no work can be done. And all the energy will end up as the random motion of atoms and molecules. Okay, so I'm going to read a verse later that really applies to this. It's amazing. Uh, I read one commenter on a science website, and they were, they were just saying how we're destined to die. We are destined to die. And they were looking at the... the uh, uh, tortoises and the Galapagos and saying, how come these things live twice our age and we don't and so forth? Well, they're still destined to die. They're just destined to die at a slower rate than we are destined to die at and so forth. And I was just like, wow, I'd be so depressed if I was one of these scientists and I didn't know God. Um, God's word explains why there's a problem. Let's look at some answers. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. I believe that mankind, in the original state, Adam and Eve, were designed to live forever. I do believe that. They were designed to live forever. Their bodies were designed to replace all the cells and to continue on and to heal if something happened. An accident still could happen, but they would heal and so forth. And yet, they were given this command and this instruction, there is a tree in the garden, and if you're going to behave willfully and, and be deceived and be disobedient and go eat that tree, there needs to be this free will, you're going to die. Now, Genesis 3, 1 to 5 says this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What a lie that was right? Where did death come from? This is the origination of it. This is the origin of all these problems that man's facing and spending billions and trying to fix. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men, all mankind, because all 
sinned. That is such a summary verse. There's an answer. People don't like the answer. Yeah, well, it's the truth. Find another answer. You can't. This is God's word. And there really, in, in, in Romans 5.12, is the second law of thermodynamics at play. Death is inevitable. Death spread to all men. No one escapes it. It's an increasing disorder that's going on. God is beyond space and time and matter. He's the creator of all things, whether visible or invisible. And he wrote into the laws, uh, into the fabric of the universe, laws, which, which cannot be undermined. Though he didn't create man to die, man chose to sin, and death is the result of sin. Now, how and when death comes about is going to be different for everybody, whether it's a random accident or whether it is um, the failing of our bodies. It's going to happen, right? Either your body couldn't handle the accident that occurred or there's just, just it takes its toll in time. Entropy decay. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So despite the warning, man chose to rebel against God, against his command, and what ensued? Death ensued, right? Romans 8, 2 calls it the law of sin and death. There's a law of sin and death, a law. And when our original parents, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God, spiritual death ensued, and, and the inevitable physical death immediately began. Children are literally born dying, because there's an increase in disorder. It's going to happen. Born dying. Is there any way to overcome that? And science calls it the second law of thermodynamics. The Bible calls it sin and consequence of it. That's what the Bible calls it. Sin and its consequence. Right? And it's a law. It's the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. From the original plan to live forever, man's lifespan prior to Noah's flood dropped to a whopping 911 years of age in average. Isn't that crazy? After the flood, and people are like, that's insane. That can't happen. Just listen. After the flood, Noah's flood, the global flood, the average lifespan is recorded to be 120 years of age on average and drops even further in what's recorded in Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, 70 years of age. And now, with a little tweaking here and there in our environment, we can live men to 74. And women, to the average, I think, is 78 or something. And this is very interesting when you consider what science has discovered concerning why we age. And, and again, millions are interested in, in spending money and trying to reverse this aging thing, right? I don't think it's age. I don't think it's time. It's, it's entropy decay. It's decay that's the problem. And... Here's another quote. Authors Morris and Clark define it. A somatic mutation, it's a body, a somatic. A somatic mutation is a sudden, random change in the structure of a cell of the body. Since almost all mutations are harmful, the gradual accumulation of mutations in the cells of various organs and tissues will inevitably lead to, the impaired, uh, to impaired bodily efficiency and eventually to complete breakdown of one or more bodily components. Okay. So... The sun's UV rays are constantly bombarding the earth and causing nearly all mutations known. Perhaps that canopy of water that was there before the flood, which dropped down, that canopy, that, that bare of, what is our ozone now? An inch and a half thick, approximately? Oh, really? And if it was, you know, six meters thick, then what? Then what kind of protection would we have? What kind of climate would be on the earth. Oh, it'd be perfect. It'd be a, a paradise around the entire globe, um, creation scientists say. So since, anyways, this canopy that's described in Genesis separated the waters above from the waters below, the Genesis record uh, talks about that, then it tells us about the global flood when this canopy drops, and it pr would prevent much of those mutations. Slow the rate of decay. Aging is still occurring, but decaying is not rapidly decurring, right? So that's how that goes. Apparently, uh, certain lizards and uh, anything of that reptile family, they just keep growing, you know? 
so there's some animals, they, they, they've got their limit. You know, my kids ask, how tall am I going to be? How tall was grandpa and so forth? And uh, they're wondering, what's the limit? Um, there's iguanas, you know, you can see six feet long, what have you. Because they just don't stop. If they could keep aging, they'd keep growing, sort of thing, right? Interesting. Uh, but much of the mutations would be slowed at, at least, a uh, slower rate. And so we see these long years before the flood, and we see shorter years uh, immediately after, and then down to 70, which has remained that way. And that explains these long lifespans and the short ones afterwards. Now, um, I, I just won't go too much further into some of these things, but I do want to talk real quick, and I want to tell you about these chromosome things I was reading about. A chromosome has at the end of it what's referred to as, quote, nonsense DNA, called telomeres. When a cell divides, the length gets shorter at the end. When there isn't any length left, it can't reproduce, and it can only wear out and die. Now, a telomere is an enzyme that repairs telomeres. So, the following is a lead paragraph in an article in Discover Magazine titled Immortal Cells. The clusters of human skin cells basking in a sterile incubator with alarms poised to go off if the level of carbon dioxide drops or the temperature wavers from 98.6 degrees appear to be blessed with eternal youth. Under normal circumstances, skin cells divide about 50 to 70 times and then quickly wither and stop dividing. But after nearly two years in a laboratory at Jaron, a Menlo Park, California biotech company, these genetically altered cells are approaching 400 divisions and still show no signs of aging. They just keep multiplying. Now, from the same article, biochemist uh, Carl Hay Harley had this report, quote, telomeres are not, uh, sorry, are not, sorry, now known to be the clock of cell aging. Telomerase is the enzyme that can rewind the clock it gives us a way to restore an increased lifespan, a youthful lifespan to aging cells. So people are trying to find a way to reverse it. They're trying to find a way to stop entropy decay. They're trying to find a way to slow it or reverse it, right? People don't want to die and they don't want to be sick, granted. Now, back to our text. Think about this. When Jesus healed all of these people, how did he do that? I could study all the science I want to. I still won't know the exact answer because I don't know about telomeres and telom telomeres or whatever, and I don't know about the chromosomes and all uh, these other things. I don't know. But it's without question that he healed so many, countless people. He repaired the cells. He introduced life again. He is beyond this world and its curse. He came without sin, right? Romans told us that death spread to all men, but Jesus came from above and he came without sin. Death had no claim upon him. Sin had no claim upon Jesus. Therefore, death had no claim upon Jesus. There was no cause for it. That's why he could, in his body, as 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2.24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Quoting Isaiah 53. Because death is a result of sin. Entropy decay is a result of sin. So he himself, without sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And now we are healed by him taking wounds upon him, our wounds upon him. It's incredible. But he heals countless people. And what was he doing? Was he rewinding the process of decay in this broken system in their body? Whatever the broken system was, he rewound that process of decay in that system. He healed that problem. He healed those cells which were, which were not working correctly. And they were healed immediately. He knows exactly where the problem is. He knows where it is. Now, we don't know what's going on. Again, it's guesswork for all the scientists. And they're usually working from symptom down to cause and maybe never finding the cause. Jesus does not work from symptom to cause. He works from cause to symptom. He works completely the other way. He treats the cause. And the cause is sin. 
The world doesn't want to hear it, but it's the reality. The cause is sin. That's the cause. Everyone's going to die, and the cause is sin. He doesn't, man treats symptoms. That's what man does. We look at symptoms, we don't feel well, and then we go around complaining, and then we don't try to fix our symptoms. Jesus knows the cause, and he goes for the heart of it. Isn't that amazing? And he, in the midst of it, he has compassion on all the weakness that, that we feel because of sin. All the problems are the effects of sin. Problems in marriages. Problems in countries. Problems with power struggles. You know, they're all results of sin. Problems of wars and ideologies and all these things. Jesus uh, came to give life and life more abundantly, John 10, 10. Life now and forever. He came to give eternal life. And eternal life is to know him. That's eternal life, John 17, 3. So he will take his people home with him and fit them with eternal bodies. He's going to return to earth, rule for a thousand years, and then the earth and all the elements, listen, will melt with fervent heat. That's what's going to happen. Jesus will create a new heaven and a new earth, and the new Jerusalem will come down. There, there was another article, and it was on the cover of the science page in The Guardian just yesterday, and it was about zombie cells. On the front page of it, zombie cells, and it showed these two different mice, and one, they, the zombie cell is a cell that is, is dead, and it can't reproduce anymore, but it still remains in the body. And so it's just there, and then it's, it, other cells, apparently they think it feed off of that, you know, and they get lazy too or whatever. That's, that's the gist of it. But they said they found a way to flush out these zombie cells, these dead cells that do nothing for humans, for organisms. And they, they fl were flushing the cells out of one mouse and letting the other mouse just continue. They weren't infecting it or anything, just let it continue. Two mice, same age, and one looked super healthy and one was withering. You know, they were able to flush these dead cells out. Still going to die. Thanks for treating more symptoms, right? He gives life abundantly. He gives it abundantly. Here's what we know. Jesus has the power. Jesus has the authority because he has no sin, and yet he took it on. He has the power. He has the authority. Jesus has the wisdom. He's the creator. He has the wisdom to enter in to the root problems and, and to heal. He has the knowledge. He has the love to do this. I think it's so wonderful who he is. In Revelation 21, 23, let me read some verses from Revelation for you. Now think about this in light of some of the stuff that I read to you. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. This is the new Jerusalem that comes down. I give you a very quick survey of the future events. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The city, the New Jerusalem, has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. And again, in Revelation 22, verse 5, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Eternal life, living forever. How does this work? No sun as well, by the way. No UV rays hitting everything, by the way. That's interesting, I think. A and you can note the absence of that, the source of these death rays, but there's also a pure river of water and the tree of life with its fruit and its leaves for the healing of the nations. Recorded in Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on the other side of the river was the, there the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, yielding her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's so awesome. Healing. Jesus came healing people, and he brings the ultimate healing, and and. And yet there's going to be this wonderful eternal life with healing. They, they were not affected by the human touch. In this text, back in Mark 6, it wasn't because people say, I want to touch Jesus. You know, because I touched him, I got healed. It's not because someone does something. You can't do a dance and make, make him, you know, respond. It was by the will of Jesus. It was by the will of God by the will of Jesus. And yet, he allowed something within them to, to make a contact, 
something by which you, you can have faith in him, but there needs to be a connection, something that carries that, if you will. And Jesus honored their faith in him. And, and in this case, it was, I could just touch the hem of his garment. If I could just touch. And just touching his garment to be healed shows something that the greatest number of people possible, given a short time, could be healed. You know, he didn't have to go through a ceremony like Leviticus shows. It wouldn't be time for that. He didn't have to um, uh, have people go do certain things. He didn't go through like even when he heals the blind man, when he picks up the dirty. No. Just the, the most simple way. People just reaching up their hand as he walks by, touches his garment, boom, they're healed. That's it. The most simple way. Yet, it's the most simple way and most broad way by which people could be healed, yet there still had to be a connection to the person who needed healing and the one who heals, Jesus. There still had to be some, a connection, right? He wasn't just healing people at distances without them hearing about him and so forth. They needed to hear about Jesus. They needed to have faith in him, ultimately, right? The afflicted person. There needed to be a connection of some kind. Though he heals Jairus' uh, or, or he heals the centurion's son, I believe it is, or daughter from a distance, yet they're hearing about Jesus. They came to him. Just say the word and he'll be well. So nothing, uh, nothing superstitious should be taking place when healing occurs. Okay, you've got to do it this way. You've got to say it with more faith, you know? You've got to lay your hand on that area, and you've got to press a little harder. Rub your hands first. I don't know. You know, like, man, you can really get into that. People can get into that. Like, how, how do we heal? How do we heal? We don't heal, first of all. It's God that heals, and he heals as he wills. As many as touched him, and at the end of verse six, uh, 56, as many as touched him were made well. As many as touched him were made well. The verb is literally were made whole or were made well. The verb literally is were being saved. That's the verb. That's amazing. They were rescued from their affliction, restored to physical wholeness, but they're being saved. And salvation is what Jesus brings for mankind. He brings salvation from the root, sin, forgiveness of sins. And that's why I was thinking about healing in a little more holistic way, if you will. You know, no, no pun intended or whatever, but like the holistic way of that. He brings salvation, the root of sin. And from there, you know, healing to, yeah, whether he heals, it's his will to heal our temporary bodies or not, that is up to him. We can ask. We can ask. We, I, don't, I don't think we can demand. You know, he's not our, we're not his boss, right? We need to submit to his will. Does God still heal people? Absolutely. Absolutely, he still heals people. And yet, salvation from sin, of course that's ultimate. And it works its way all the way out to the outer man. I've been saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. Right? I've been forgiven. I'm being sanctified. I will be glorified. This body is going to put on a new body. Right? A new creation. Wonderful. And we'll get to see so much more uh, next week about how uh, these guys are going to challenge Jesus in chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem, and they want to challenge Jesus. Right? They want to challenge him. They, they, they are going to talk about outward in stuff. And Jesus is going to talk to them about inward out stuff. And that's how he heals. Inward out stuff. You know, it's, it's amazing. Um, he was going, we can go around to all places and we can bring people to Jesus. We can tell them about Jesus. And, and we can pray for, for people's uh, physical healing. We can ask the Lord to do that. But we're not... Uh, relying on that. He's not bound to, to that. He's, he's much greater than that, isn't he? He's our creator. He knows what the problems are, and he has addressed them, and he's continuing to address them through his gospel going out to people. People need hope. They need help, and the hope is found in the gospel, in the resurrection 
the resurrection. Amen? So if you want to grab Lloyd, please, Steve, and we're going to pray and just uh, thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that all authority is yours. All dominion, might, power is yours. Lord, I've said many confusing words. Hopefully that uh, we can get something out of it. Uh, thank you that you overlook inadequacies that I have and that you help us to begin to think about things where we can see that you're such an amazing healer, Lord. And we have such a hope. One day, Lord, we're going to have perfect bodies and our spirit that's been made new. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Our soul that's being made new is going to receive a brand new body to house that resurrected life that you've given us. Lord, we have such a hope. Our desire is for eternal life. And I do believe that we were designed to live forever. And Lord, I thank you that because that desire is in our hearts, um, what evidence there is, Lord, that there's a purpose you have for that. And we will. We'll, we'll be able to have eternal life in you without the decay, without the corruption. And Lord, forgive us. Forgive us of sin, Lord, which is the root of this problem. I thank you that you don't let sin continue forever. I thank you that you don't, you're not going to let it ravage humanity forever and ever and ever. Lord, I thank you that your answer doesn't just provide a continuation of, of death and life coexisting together. Your solution, Lord, is to have life and life more abundant and life eternal without death. And I thank you for that. You overcame the grave for us, our enemy, and our hope is in you and your resurrection. So take us home, Lord. Come quickly, Maranatha. We love you and we thank you for being our healer and that you do heal from all disease.